Here's the scenario. You've been injured in a serious accident. The doctor says your recovery could take months, maybe even years, yet your insurance company is denying your claim every step of the way. If something like this happens to you, call me, Brian Goldfinger of Goldfinger Personal Injury Law. We have offices in Toronto, London, Peterborough, and now Kitchener-Waterloo. Visit goldfingerlaw.com and get us working for you. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I have to say, this team looks pretty damn good. Six wins in a row. This is the Raptors Reaction Podcast. I'm your host, Samson Folk, and the Raptors just defeated the Hornets, 116-101. to And the fans over in Carolina, I, I guess the, the North version of Carolina <laughs> in Charlotte, and uh, they're probably looking at Pascal Siakam like some sort of basketball deity his ability to control a game and imprint his will upon it to influence what happens has gotten to a very very high level and uh it only seems to be ratcheting up from here i don't know what the conceivable end of it is but the hornets certainly uh weren't able to find out because he just kept on playing better and better when he was in single coverage he eviscerated them when they doubled him either you know on the block above the break wherever he found the open man. And not just the open man, the open man you want shooting the ball, for example, or hitting the, you know, hitting the basket near the basket. You, you, he was immense. He was incredible. And the last time the Raptors played the Hornets, they, <laughs> they played it without Fred Van Vliet. And so I thought it was an interesting wrinkle that they played a similar style of basketball in this one, going to Point Pascal, and they didn't take away Gary Trent Jr.'s possessions. They let him cook. And what we got in this game was where Fred Van Vliet and Gary Trent Jr. kind of oscillated, at least in the first half, I would say, with Gary Trent Jr. receiving a lot of the pick and roll and handoff packages that I think they typically run through Fred. And Fred just kind of worked off ball. At the end of this game, he sits with 25 and 5. He hit six threes shot 55% on his three-pointers. That's great. If a guy's going to play off ball, that's what that's what you want to happen, obviously. If, especially a guy who can't just like back cut for dunks and stuff like that. You can see OG finished with 20 points in this game. Some of that was cutting. Some of that was getting out on the run in transition. And on the other end of the floor, Fred, I thought, played just very, very good defense on LaMelo Ball. Yes, he had 15 and 9, but he's 5 of 19 from the floor. And I think that really stands out once you kind of recognize that Fred was helping to reroute him into less advantageous positions. He was denying the primary action. And then in some cases, he was just funneling him into help and ball was being put in really tough decisions or situations, I should say, where the floater had to go up or a pull-up jumper had to go up. And the 5 of 19, I think, is pretty representative of what Fred was able to do to him as a point of attack defender. And Fred might have been able to give that matchup a little extra juice because Gary and Pascal were taking on a little bit more than they normally do. That was cool to see. A little bit, for the first time, I don't know, in in quite a few games, we saw a schematic wrinkle offensively, and a fairly severe one, I would say, because the Raptors' offense has been kind of taking form, and especially since Pascal came back, and Pascal's been able to, you know, bend teams to his will as often as he has been. We're looking at Fred kind of realizing where he fits in in this offensive hierarchy. When when Pascal came back, it was still Fred at the top, and Pascal got the touches that filtered down. And Pascal actually had less touches in games than Scotty Barnes still when he came back. And now we're looking at Fred is still getting the most touches, is still on ball the most. He's the point guard. But Pascal has kind of been ratcheting up as far as how much how many possessions he's taking, what he's doing with the ball, And so it's kind of like a a two-headed dragon at the top of things. And Pascal, at least in the past month, has looked like the the more potent dragon. It's not a competition, of course. They're they're teammates. They they both want to play good. And it was cool to see, particularly in the first half, Gay Trent Jr. kind of take on that second fiddle role to Pascal 
and for Fred Van Vliet to just be, you know, really a hound defensively and to work off ball as a shooter, take on second side action um, possessions and stuff like that. I thought that was unique. I thought that was a fun wrinkle and the Raptors, I, it worked. I mean, they won by 15 and <laughs> Fred only played, what, 37 minutes. That's pretty low for Fred. Pascal still played like 43. But Pascal, I mean, he looks as good as he's ever looked. His first step, he made, it, you know, it's not that impressive to make Miles Pumley look slow. He made Miles Pumley look really slow. But he also made Miles Bridges look slow at times. He made PJ Washington look weak at times. It's this incredible ability of Pascal's to mix finesse and strength dependent on matchup, right? And the Hornets are a team that really struggles with who they might throw at him. And they found, you know, that anybody, because he always had something to go to, whether it was finesse, like that spin move on Miles Bridges, where Miles was trying to beat him to a spot that Pascal just wasn't going to. And Pascal is spinning past him and straight to the bucket for a hoop. And you have, you know, they're doubling him above the break. They're trying to blitz him and he's just making these passes and they have nothing they can throw his way that even makes him stressed. He's taking all of it in stride, whether it's coming fast or slow, whatever. He, they just didn't have an answer for him. And Gary Trent Jr., I found myself encouraged, I would say, by his possessions on ball, although I think they were probably not as fruitful as Fred Van Vliet's might have been. But that's not the way basketball works. You're not always trying to maximize. Like, that's what heliocentric teams are, right? Is they say points per possession is at its highest, you know, it reaches its fever pitch when this guy has the ball. Let's give this guy a 40% usage rate. And the Raptors very clearly do not do that with Pascal, OG, Fred, Gary, Scotty Barnes. Like, it, there's a lot of uh, diversity in the way that people are handling the ball. The looks they give... And so they're giving guys different opportunities to stretch their legs in different ways. And so Gary, you know, he got trapped quite a bit. And the passes he made out of it, I think, were one pass away. And there wasn't much manipulation going on. But on top of that, he made a couple nice passes over the top to a short roller. Not everything resulted in assist. In fact, he only had one, which is quite, or sorry, two, which is quite low for, you know, the amount of possessions he had. But this is a growing part of his game. And and I wrote about it at the start of January. He had put together his best playmaking str stretch of his career. Only that was off of, I would say, a lot of pin downs and a lot of handoffs. He was manipulating his sh shooting talent, I would say. And you look at this game, it's not really that. This is more structured, traditional pick and roll stuff and primary action stuff. And so some good decisions were made. Some shot clock, like some seconds on the shot clock were wasted. But this is stuff he'll get used to. And I think this is something he'll get better at over time. He's still super young. He still is, shoots the hell out of the ball. And, and that was also kind of a funny thing, right? Because they're blitzing Gary Trent Jr. when he's on ball. Even though, well, I guess also when you think about it, he's been one of the better isolation players in the NBA. So I guess if you don't want to leave it up to isolation... And if they were scared of him getting to a spot, hitting a jumper or something like that, then it makes sense to kind of pressure the ball, see if you can turn him over and get out running the other way, which they had some success with in this game, albeit not at Gary's expense. But they pressured him a lot on ball and they kept forgetting about him off ball. Like you'd see guys would shade to the wrong player. Like there was one possession where Precious Sachua received detention, you know, it, on the weak side. And Gary Trent Jr. managed to kind of slip loose into space for a jumper. That just, can that happen? That seems unforgivable, right? That's not something you can have happen. And so, yeah, that was interesting. The Hornets obviously do not, they aren't a fantastic defense or anything like that. But I thought the way they defended was interesting in this game, especially since I didn't find that there was a like conceptual symmetry of how they viewed anybody on the roster, except for Pascal. He received a lot of attention no matter where he was. But there was a significant disconnect for when Gary was on ball to pressure, pressure, pressure. And then when he was off ball, they're losing track of him. And as you can see, like four of nine uh, from downtown in this game, really nice numbers from deep. He got out running in transition, I think for three or four buckets in this game too. And so the half court shot making wasn't like a huge part of his game because they just pressured the hell out of him. 
but he did such a good job of creating his own offense by turning defense into offense. And he made some passes that I may not might not have expected him to make as a primary. So Gary, I think, did a fantastic job of melding together these new responsibilities on ball and then just really thriving at the things that we've come to expect, which is terrific uh, off-ball shooting and then you know getting steals and running out in transition, be it he's the one finishing or whoever else, right? So I thought that was great. Scotty, um, he piled on a bunch of points at the end of the game, but largely I thought he just struggled in this one. And that's that's not anything terrible. He had by far the most difficult defensive matchup and, and offensive to some degree because the Hornets kind of stretched their defensive shell out. And Scotty, something I've noticed is that when, when the defense is set, he has a lot of problem engaging with it and attacking it. Well, actually, let me amend that. When the defense is set and shading him for a drive, when he's in single coverage, he, he will take anybody on and do anything in the world. And if teams said dig downs, he's pretty good at fending them off or making the pass out, picking a guy out on the perimeter or, you know, a lay down to somebody in the paint or something like that. But when he's being shaded from the start, you saw like four or five possessions where he just has the ball above the break and it sits in his hands without any motion for five seconds, four or five seconds. And that is just a complete waste of what, you know, your time on the clock to create offense. And in this game, he didn't create very much. And defensively, he had a lot of trouble because he had the worst uh, defensive assignment. I do not envy him. Miles Plumlee is a huge person and Scotty Barnes is not. And he was asked to hang tight with him and, he had a hell of a time trying to do it. Like he was in foul trouble very early on. And it's just that them's the break sometimes, right? It's you're going to be in a really tough position. The Raptors have asked that of him as a rookie. And so you get like kind of an um, underwhelming performance tonight. And, you know, you kind of just like pat him on the back and say, you took one for the team. Look how everyone else thrived. We held, you know, a decent offensive team to a low scoring night and we had a really good night offensively on the other end. That's Barnes taking one for the team and continuing to learn and grow as defenses look different, as playing defense looks different depending on the matchup and stuff like that. So this is all all stuff he's taking in and learning from and no doubt growing as well. So even though it was a struggle for him, I I uh I thought, you know, that's worthwhile. It didn't look as pretty as, you know, somebody would have wanted, but it, this is a learning experience and the Raptors are winning at the same time. Good to see. OG, I thought, was the like the best defender on the floor tonight. Uh, the Hornets ping the ball around. They like to pass a lot. They play beautiful basketball when they're at their best. And Ananobi, as a ball hawk, can kind of shut down like half the court if he's on the weak side. His ability to track the ball down and then bust out in transition, or even just help other people bust out in transition, lock down passing lanes, or even just deflect it out of bounds. He's a tough guy to outfox. It's really, really hard to get him to jump on passes that you're not making. It's really, really hard to move him out of passing lanes because he doesn't bite. And when you release it, he can get on that thing, and he can take it for a pick six. Raptors fans are well aware of this fact. I mean, you, the listener, obviously are. And I thought that his patrolling of the passing lanes was tremendous in this game. And on top of that, I just thought it was really, really impressive the way he was able to help out on the defensive glass a little bit, but on offense, push for offensive rebounds as well. I think he had five in this game. So even though he had a clunky offensive game that certainly had its highs and lows where his strength creation, his ability to bully to the rim was really on display, and then some of the clunkier on-ball possessions didn't look good at all. And then some of the on-ball possessions, you have like that, you know, a series of moves, combos to get Miles Plumlee off of him and step back and hit a jumper when the game looks a little bit close. That, that was fantastic to see. And then Chris Boucher coming off the bench. I think it was a plus 23 in this one. That is emblematic of, of his impact. He was awesome. Uh, the defense looked much better with him on the floor. His timely cuts into space on offense the little bit of punch he provided on the offensive glass. It's he's been such a positive player for such a long stretch of time now that I'm just like, man, this guy is a fixture of a playoff rotation. I, unless there's like, I don't want to be dumb and say like, 
you don't trade Chris Boucher. You don't whatever. Like, there's always upgrades that can be made. There's always situations where teams want a guy. But given, like, where the where the market might be on Chris Boucher and how important he's been to the Raptors rotation, it's just really, really hard to imagine that they'd be getting, a, if he's not being packaged for, like, a pseudo-star because, you know, if if the Raptors are getting an all-star, like, who are they trading, right? That's that's a tough conversation. But you do not trade Boucher for a lateral move. He, he is very much a huge part of what is working with the Raptors here. And I, he's impressive. He's impressive. He, he's, he's a positive defender now. And in this crazy scheme the Raptors run, he's found a home. And whether it's, you know, the funk lineups on offense – playing traditional like center basketball, cutting into space, mirroring pick and roll actions and stuff like that. Yes, that's good, but he's starting to thrive in the structured and unstructured version of this team. And I just, good for him. He, he's been so good. Precious, uh, like a, a mixed bag in this game, but only because this was a, a difficult game for him to kind of fit into. The Hornets play five out a lot of the time. And he didn't match up minutes with Plumley, So you're looking at a guy that's either defending like Bridges or, uh, or PJ Washington. And that's a very strange fit for him. It's not that he's out of his depth. It's just it kind of moves him away from the strongest parts of his defensive game. And he certainly didn't suffer there. But on the other side of things, too, it meant that, you know, the Hornets, they, they were extending the shell of their defense and Precious doesn't really know how to move within a, an offense yet, right? That's still like very much a gap in what he's able to provide. And so a lot of these offensive possessions had him sitting in the corner. And that's fine because the Raptors, they made it work offensively. But for Precious's game in particular, it was just kind of like, you know, it, it was a strange fit for him. But I certainly didn't think he did poorly in that grouping. A Banton? Banton is like the ultimate example of, be it Fred, Pascal, whichever of the two stars you want to talk about. And with Banton, you're usually talking about Pascal more than Fred just because of the way that the rotations have worked. But the incredible ability to make use of just bodies on the floor, like a, a warm body, somebody to play defense and to just be around on offense. And Banton is just keeps... Winning minutes while giving you almost nothing in the box score. And it's because he defends. He gets in passing lanes. He He's aggressive on like handoffs and he's aggressive in pick and roll actions. And when they run zone, he's got a pretty good idea of how to fit into it and how to kind of make those spaces that the Hornets for tonight want to get into seem a little bit more squeezed, a little bit more claustrophobic. And he doesn't have to give you anything on offense. And he didn't tonight. Zero points. He went to the line, you know, after making a cut and getting fouled. He missed both his free throws, no assists, no steals, but just helping add to that claustrophobic, you know, effect of the Raptors defense. That was a big part of Banton's game in this one. So, yeah, it's a uh, it's an interesting like, oh, how impactful is Pascal right now? Well, Pascal is very impactful because he's just dragging guys to like immensely positive minutes because of his ability to influence and control. Uh, team offense or offense at the team level, I should say. Reggie Evans Award. Uh, I'm going Chris Boucher, and I already talked about him. I think it's it's fairly obvious at this point. Yes, that that guy is my he's my Reggie Evans Award winner. The top quick reaction comment is from Arshdeep Singh. Quote: I promise you guys, Masai and Bobby are going to end up trading Drogic plus assets for an impact player. I don't know who, but they will add to this core at the deadline. I don't care if we're young. This team is already too good and too talented, and the East has no clear-cut favorite. Time to take the league by storm, end quote. Yeah, I don't know about making promises. Impact player? I, we'll see. But, uh, yeah, I, 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 I hope they do. I wouldn't make any promises, though, because it takes two to tango and sometimes three, sometimes four. There's some big trades out there. <laughs> um, yeah, but I like the, I like the optimism. I, ho I, I sincerely hope they get somebody at the deadline. And Dragic plus a first, uh, I hope they can get somebody good. I think that would be awesome. But thanks for writing in, Arsteep. Uh, oh, you know, your thoughts are always welcome. 
as are anybody's. Uh, yeah, listener, I hope you enjoyed this. Thanks for tuning in. Whether you got into this in the morning or at night, have a blessed day and goodbye. <laughs>